but something tells me they're 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 never going to be allowed to just uh, uh, spill the beans. I because then they have to admit they lied, in my opinion. But uh, anyways, we'll talk about all that tonight. It would be nice. I'd love to see uh, disclose. I'd love to see the news uh, taking it more serious. Even the fake news becoming real news. That would be great. Um, it would, but, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't hold my breath, but you know, for all of us, all who are listening to this show, I think a good deal of, you know, that we're not alone. And, uh, that's why you take such an interest in these topics, just like I do. Now let's go ahead. Now don't forget the website is triple W dot late night in the midlands.com. Go on over, become a member, be informed and by all means inform others. Uh, looking forward to uh, getting things rolling here. I've got Russ Kalka and uh, Dr. Lisa uh, Gallinier, I think, or Gallinu. Uh, she'll have to help me out with that one. But Russ is the leader in the disclosure movement, previously an active member of the disclosure lobby. Uh, Russ has now taken the reins for the U.S. based disclosure effort. And uh, he's convinced by overwhelming evidence of an extraterrestrial intelligence engaging the human race since 10 years old. Um, he's come to the final conclusion that the only thing that will save this planet from self-destruction and allow the human species to advance our development amongst the stars is the formal acknowledgement of an extraterrestrial presence. It's called Disclosure. And he's got hashtag Disclosure there. Um, a sociocultural anthropologist, futurist, and experiencer, Lisa is committed to illuminating the truth about our extraterrestrial and extra-dimensional visitors, as well as challenging the truth embargo. She says she's always taken it for granted that contact with extraterrestrial life is looming on the horizon for humanity. As an optimist, she tends to see this as something that would be full of possibility and indeed the very thing we need rather than something to fear. I would agree with that. Whether it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing, you know, I'm willing to take that chance. I, you know, I, I want to, it's not that I want to know, because I do know. I feel like I know. Uh, but uh, I want to I wanna see one. I want to meet one. I, hey, if it's scary, let it be scary, but I'm ready. All right, so with that, folks, let's go ahead and bring uh, Russell and Lisa on with us. I'm going to go ahead and uh, dial up Russell, and then we'll add Lisa as well. And hopefully everything works well here tonight. Skype's been just horrible and to me. All Thank right. You. It's Russ. Good to be with you. Hey, Russ, Lisa. Uh, well, is it is it Doctor? Uh, right. I am a doctor. Oh. Yes. Okay. Well, then I'll just say uh, Russell and Doctor. Uh, can you uh, help me out with your last name there? <laughs> My last name is Galarno. Galarno. Okay. All right. So, listen, I welcome you both to Late Night in the Midlands. It's great to have you. I'm looking great forward to be here. I'm looking forward to uh, talking with you both and really picking your brains about what you know about the uh, UFO extraterrestrial phenomena. And uh, I guess let's start with a little background. How did uh, whoever wants to start out? Uh, how did you both get involved in this? What uh, what got you going in this direction? Yeah, I could take it, uh, okay. I guess, to, uh, to to boot here. And, Michael, uh, what I want to do before I even uh, give a, just a brief description for sure. your listeners is I want to set the tone here okay. uh, that will uh, that is relevant to the rest of this conversation. Um, and so I, I do welcome all of your listeners to please pay attention. Um, for those of you that may remember a gentleman by the name of James Fox, um, who's still you know, pretty pretty big today, he's a UFO uh, film producer, and he created two wonderful documentaries years ago. One was called Out of the Blue, and one was called I Know What I Saw. And he handed out copies of Out of the Blue to every member of the house. He knocked down on everyone's door. And it took him a week to do it. And he sent a personalized letter to every member's chief of staff. And he had some conversations with some that, that were keen on the UAP, UFO uh, phenomenon. And some weren't and didn't know any more than the regular Joe on the street. But the quote is, 
and was uh, said to him by one of the chief of staffs, look, we cannot touch this subject matter unless the general public, our constituents, put enough pressure on us. Only then can we take action in helping to assemble the administration. So I just want everyone to take that and put that in their back pockets and understand that the public is one of the keys to unlocking this initiative. Okay. I am 31 years old. I am a business development executive in the marketing and advertising space, uh, primarily uh, for technology and SaaS platforms. SaaS is software as a service. My interest level in this issue dates back to when I was about eight or nine years old. My mother has been a science teacher for a very long time. So uh, one can say that uh, the sciences course throughout my veins and my blood. And her father, before he passed, had a lot of great interest in this subject as well. So one night we sat down, we watched Close Encounters of the Third Kind and E.T. on two separate occasions. And uh, the, the mystique uh, behind those two movies is what uh, got my attention. My original grandfather passed on and my grandmother remarried. And when she did, she married a United States Air Force veteran. And during the Korean War, which was between 1950 and 1953, he was a pilot and he was stationed here in the country down at Laredo Air Force Base in Texas. Uh, he was with five other crew members and, and that military base, Michael, is now defunct. It hasn't been open for quite some time. Um, but it was at the tail end of 53, probably third or fourth quarter, that he was with about four or five crew members in a C-137 Stratoliner, which was a Boeing transport plane. And he was doing reconnaissance uh, between Louisiana and Texas. And a craft flew out of the sky, circled their, their plane for about 30 seconds, and shot off. You know how the stories like these goes. Oh, yeah. Um, and he got down to the ground. And being an Air Force vet, he was, of course, debriefed by Alphabet City. <laughs> and he was sworn to secrecy through both uh, signing documents and threats. Of course, when he told me the story at 10 years old, it didn't really matter to him anymore. Um, that one story is what propelled me down what you call the, the rabbit hole, for lack of better terms, and uh, allowed me to meet different people, talk to different experiencers, uh, as well as researchers, researchers in this field, um, and do a lot of digging on my own. And my advocacy in all of this started about two and a half years ago. Um, you may recall a group on Facebook that was part and parcel to supporting Steve Bassett and his work in PRG. That yeah. group was called the Disclosure Lobby, which is now shut down. Um, I am not, I was not the administrator behind that, uh, but I was a very large part of that group. Um, and did, uh, did Facebook shut it down or did the, whoever was running it? It, it, it was the moderator that, that, that shut that down to go off and do other things. Oh, um, I see. And, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, maybe it was a signal for, for a new group, a new blood, a new face of disclosure to, to, to come out. And that's exactly what we're doing. And we're going to get into what the disclosure activists are all about during this call uh, okay. and where we're going. Uh, but yeah, that's just a brief kind of introduction, break the ice on, on my experiences to date. All right. And uh, doctor, how about you? Uh, what, what got you going in this direction? I mean, you know, it's uh uh, it's, it's quite the rabbit hole. <laughs> it is. And, um, so I was born in 1969 and I grew up in the seventies and eighties and was exposed to all sorts of things, science fiction and paranormal and the mysteries of the cosmos and our planet. And I was always fascinated by all of those things. Um, I'm actually an experiencer myself, although I'm also a professional researcher. I'm an anthropologist and a futurist. But um, I had my first contact experience at the age of five, um, which I was not expecting, as you can imagine. I woke up in the middle of the night um, to find that there were a couple of glow-in-the-dark beings standing at the foot of the bed. It was sort of a man and a woman, and they were adults, and I was a child. Um, and I recall they seemed to be dressed in sort of very fancy outfits, almost used something that looked Victorian. Um, but they were absolutely lit up from the inside, and um, they just stood at the end of the bed for about five minutes. Um, they didn't say anything. There was no telepathic communication. There was nothing other than these two glow-in-the-dark beings staring at me. So at one point, I poked my mother, because I was actually in bed with her, and I said, Mom, there are a couple of people standing at the end of the bed, and they're staring at me. 
And I was actually indignant about it. I was like, well, if you're going to stand there, why don't you say something kind of thing? <laughs> Um, and my mother said, oh, they're your guardian angels. Go to sleep. Don't worry about it. And I said, oh, okay. So I just went to sleep with them still standing there. And around the same time, I had a bunch of other things um, happen as well. I was, you know, very visually sensitive to energies and things like that. So I would lay in my bed at night and see all of these sort of energies and you know, streaks of light and things flying around the bedroom. And, you know, of course, this was my normal. So I didn't think too much about it. I assumed that, you know, this happened to everyone. Um, so fast forward um, till I was about 15 and I had an out of body experience as well um, during sort of a meditation. It was a bit like a lucid dream, um, but I was kind of whooshed out of my body and taken to another very alien place. I'll call it that. Uh, I don't know if I was physically whooshed out of my body um, or it was just, you know, sort of a daytime dream kind of experience, but, you know, this is sort of how it felt. Um, so, you know, th these interests were sort of percolating with me a little bit, and I was, like I said, I was exposed to a lot of the concepts and ideas and, you know, very open-minded, if you will. Um, in 1986, I went to Chile um, for a year as an exchange student, and I had a pretty major UFO or UAP, if you want to call it that, sighting while I was in um, Chile. It was exciting enough that I woke up the entire household at 3 o'clock in the morning <laughs> to try and get everybody to go outside to see this thing that I'd been watching for about a half an hour. It was um, a large orange orb. And... Um, it was stationary part of the time, and then a few times it would disappear and reappear somewhere else, kind of in my field of vision. It emanated sort of a very low hum, and um, I noticed that a lot of the other sounds that I'd gotten used to because we were staying on a farm at the time, you know, animals, insects, and things, had gotten completely quiet. So uh, by the time we got outside to see this vessel, <laughs> or this you know shiny orb that I had witnessed, it was gone. But the next morning at breakfast, the whole family, and we had this long conversation about the preponderance of, of UFO sightings that there are in that part of the world, um, you know, which I found very interesting. But it was another one of those things I just sort of tucked away. Um, when I was 17, I joined the Army. I was in military intelligence as a Russian linguist. I didn't stay in for very long. I was in for about a year and a half. Um, but I got some exposure to the military and military structures. And, you know, that whole part of the UFO story is really interesting to me and something that, you know, I can sort of understand a little bit better having had that point of view. But when I got out of the Army, I went to UC Berkeley. Um, I began as a linguistics and Slavic languages and literatures major and later changed my major to anthropology. But in the meantime, I had found an engineering professor at UC Berkeley who was working on ufological topics. And I spent quite some time working with him. And I was transcribing interviews from people like Travis Walton, actually Travis Walton's polygraphy, uh, polygraph tests. Um, and various things like this. But I kind of continued with my career, in, which, you know, I ended up in the tech industry. I've been working in the tech industry for about 25 years at this point. And I would say it was about 10 years ago when my interest um, truly got peaked. Um, I sort of fell down some rabbit holes, as, as Russ said. I've been interested in the channeled messages, the transmissions from supposed ascended beings and various extraterrestrial and extra-dimensional beings, um, which I started to study in great detail. I've exposed myself to several thousand of them at this time and was doing a bit of what we anthropologists would call a content analysis um, to try and figure out, well, what are the motivations behind these messages? And I'm actually a skeptic, believe it or not, and I was skeptical about the messages too, but I realized as a spiritual person that you know, regardless of, of whom they originated from, they're still useful messages in, in many ways. But this got more interesting because after, you know, just a few months of me listening to these messages from this organization called the Galactic Federation of Light, um, I started reaching out in meditation and I started to have my own telepathic contact experiences. And that's been going on now for almost 10 years. 
and I have several beings um, that I talk to on a daily basis about all sorts of things. I mean, they were just talking to me earlier about new leaks from WikiLeaks and how I need to go look for this thing and, you know, all of this. So I'm knee deep in the experiencer world as well as looking at the phenomenon from a more scientific perspective, which really interests me as well. I see. Wow, that's uh, it's very detailed uh, in your description, too. Thank you. Um, Monster, now you, you mentioned when you were five years old, uh, that was your first uh, encounter. And that leads me to, like, children who will run out, Mom, Dad, there's a monster in my room. You know, I wonder how much of a regular occurrence this kind of thing is and how many times kids are just blown off about it. Well, that often happens. I mean, you know, what I've been told is that children are more sensitive in that period of time. And what my team has told me since then is that that appearance was was done very deliberately to open my mind to possibilities beyond what I was perceiving with my, you know, five primary senses in a 3D, 4D reality. So, um, so they do that kind of thing with children, you know, more sensitive children quite a lot, um, you know, just to keep our minds open to those possibilities. It was an unforgettable experience, I can tell you that. I mean, even at that age, I knew it was very strange. Oh, I bet it was. Now, um, the whole out-of-body thing, now, that's something that I've been very curious about as to whether sometimes in these abductions, if uh, if if that's how they do it, rather than taking the whole physical person, do they might might they take you out of your body? And if they do, as a child, do they sometimes try to put you in a familiar surrounding so that you feel comfortable? Like uh, they might take you out of your out of your house, and maybe you you know you're on the ship, but you don't know you're on the ship. You think you're just in your room, that kind of they thing. Yeah, that happened when I was 15, and they've told me that that was a projection. So I wasn't actually taken out of body. Okay. Um, they sort of created a, a temporary holographic reality for me to experience, um, you know, for 30 minutes or so. Um, and I don't re recall being on the craft so much. Um, I recall arriving on what I would call this alien planet. And I recall the the buildings that I was in, and I recall being introduced to a group of beings and having an interaction with them. Um, I don't recall them speaking English or anything like that. Um, my team that I work with now, they speak English because they've learned it from observing me and observing humanity for quite some time. Um, but at that point, I was just sort of getting impressions about what was going on and not a whole lot of you know communication. But it was extremely visual. Um, you know, and very much like being in, you know, a dream state, but I, I wasn't asleep, you know, it was, it was qualitatively different from, you know, experiences of being asleep and dreaming. I see. And now you, uh, last you, you mentioned the Galactic Federation of Light. Now it's been a while since I've heard about that Galactic Federation of Light. So then this is... I, I actually I had doubts about it, but you're saying that this this Galactic Federation of Light actually exists. It's real. Yeah, I mean you can actually dig if you just go onto YouTube, for instance, and you search for the Galactic Federation of Light, or you go on the web and you look, you will find literally thousands of messages from them. Um, and it's you know the, the Galactic Federation of Light is an umbrella term that they decided to embrace because it was frankly too complicated to try and tell humanity um, that, you know, there are up to a couple of hundred different species or races, you know, that are currently involved and interested in our development. So they consider themselves kind of a coalition of forces. And some of the beings are from the Pleiades star cluster, some are from the Andromeda galaxy, some are from, you know, the Sirius star system, you know, and, and they actually break that down. So the transmissions, for instance, will come from a being named Salusa, let's say, who's from Sirius and who's channeled by a guy in England whose name is Mike Quincy. Um, and Mike Quincy alone has put out hundreds or thousands of messages. I mean, it usually... You know, there's there's at least one a week. Sometimes there are more. They've definitely been increasing in frequency. And so there are probably 20 or 30, maybe more 
messages that come out each week that are mm. affiliated with this loose coalition of beings who refer to themselves as the Galactic Federation of Light. Wow. Now, is this the same one that I've heard that uh, apparently is supposed to be led by Lucifer or, or is that just some kind of internet gossip? That was one attempt to debunk the Galactic Federation of Light. I can tell you as a skeptic and a researcher myself, when I, you know, went down the rabbit hole and started listening to channeled messages by this entity called Salusa from Sirius, um, I went looking for, you know, let's see if it's a hoax, let's see if, you know, anyone has called BS on this and, you know, what do they have to say? And there have been a couple of attempts, but um, I can tell you that that phenomenon alone you know, 95% of it is just message after message after message um, that are very positive in nature and very spiritual in nature. And they do give tangible information and they talk about things that are happening, say, geopolitically in our world. Um, but most of the messages are about increasing individual consciousness and contributing in more positive ways to raising the entire consciousness of the planet. And that's what got my attention. I decided, you know what, I don't care if this is coming from E.T. or not. You know, it's good, useful stuff for someone on a spiritual journey. I see. Now, uh, getting uh, back to the whole disclosure thing, and Russ, feel free to jump in whenever you like. Uh, um, so so tell me more about the mission that you, you both are on. Sure. Um, so what got me to... Um, and the Disclosure Activist was formed uh, just following Trump's inauguration speech because he had said something during that speech. It got me thinking, and uh, I just had one of those light bulb moments. Um, and I had, I had asked Lisa to join me because she does have an incredible perspective on this. Um, and, and with a political uh, issue that Disclosure is, uh, the scientific realm definitely kind of wraps itself around that. But um, what got me to get to this point is that there have been a very specific set of circumstances that have occurred over the last two plus years that convince me that elements within the military intelligence are keen to see disclosure. And it's going to hark back to my point earlier about that quote about having public action. So the story begins, and I'm going to lay this out as methodically, succinct, and concise as I possibly can. Okay. You might hear me use the word unprecedented numerous times, <laughs> All right. um, because that is exactly what's going on. Uh, but the story begins... Um, Back in 93, some of your listeners, if, if not all of them, are probably more than familiar with Michael of what's called the Rockefeller Initiative. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that was an engagement by Lawrence Rockefeller, who was a billionaire philanthropist, to engage the Clinton administration and White House to dig down to the bottom of the UFO files and release them to the public. And there was quite a, a team associated from the governmental aspect of the Rockefeller Initiative, such as Bill and Hillary Clinton, uh, Dr. Jack Gibbons who is the director of the uh, Office of Science, Technology, and Policy. Um, he's now passed uh, John Podesta, who you're going to hear about tonight, uh, Webster Hubble, Ron Pandolfi over the CIA, and then a bunch of other ones such as Al Gore, Leon Panetta, Mac McClarty, Bill Richardson, and George uh, Stephanopoulos. So a lot of key names here. And the Rockefeller Initiative failed. Okay, so Clinton uh, tried to get to the bottom of it. He couldn't. He was stonewalled, just I like just like Carter was, I believe. Uh, and so it ended in 96. It was a three-year initiative. At that time, John Podesta, who is very closely tied to the Clintons, and I might add, Michael, that John Podesta, he is a man of extreme political significance. He is the center of all power in Washington, D.C., and is a very well deep insider and connected individual. So when John Podesta says things, People really need to listen. So at that time when Clinton got stonewalled and the Rockefeller Initiative ended, a decision was made that if and when Hillary Clinton was to engage a White House candidacy, she, they were going to push her to become the disclosure president. And by doing so, they left different trails of breadcrumbs over many years that set the stakes for such a thing. In 2002, Podesta, as you know, came out in Washington, D.C. to the National Press Club 
announcing the Coalition of Freedom of Information. And during that press announcement, he had said, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, the time has come to be transparent. Uh, the government ought to release these documents because it's the law, which is the truth. And the American public, quite frankly, can handle the truth, which I'm convinced of. So that's great. He comes out and he says that. A year goes by, and on October 23rd, a day, a year and a day later, Podesta comes back out again to the National Press Club for the Coalition of Freedom of Information and says the exact same thing. Fantastic. 2004 comes, and then Governor Bill Richardson, who was part of the Rockefeller Initiative, talks a little bit about the Roswell Dig Diaries, which is a book, and he wrote the forward to it and you know called for the U.S. Air Force's reinvestigation of Roswell. Uh, in 2005, Bill Clinton goes to Hong Kong and sits down and talks about how he approached this and, and you know, was stonewalled. 2007 comes and, you know, Bill Richardson comes back onto Chris Matthews and, again, just talks about some stuff with the, um, with the Rockefeller Initiative. So many years go by after, about seven years go by and not much is going on. And then Steve Bassett of PRG puts together a phenomenal citizen hearing on disclosure, which you and your listeners are probably very familiar with. Oh, yeah, Washington, I've, had, I've had Steve on several times in the past. Uh, yeah. Sure, sure. So 30 hours of that uh, couple of days that it ran was devoted to the evidence surrounding the Rockefeller Initiative. So that happened in 2013. So a year goes by. And on April 2nd of 2014, and everyone's going to see where I'm going with this. So just bear with me. On April 2nd of 2014, the DVDs of the Citizen Hearing on Disclosure was supposed to go out, but there was some kind of production error that I think Steve talked about, and it didn't end up going. But Bill Clinton didn't know that. So what he does is six days before that Citizen Hearing video was to be released to Congress or delivered to Congress, Clinton appears on Jimmy Kimmel, right? And when somebody of Bill Clinton's stature appears on Jimmy Kimmel, the questions that Kimmel asks are already scripted beforehand. So Bill Clinton right. knew exactly what questions were going to be asked. And one of those questions was about, you know, Kimmel says, I'm going to put my hand on the Bible. And if I was president, I would run right to the files and figure out, you know, if Roswell was real. Did you do that? And Clinton responds. And everyone can see that response on YouTube if they want and go see a video. And in fact, Ben Hansen, who I think was a former FBI analyst, did an analysis of that video. So that was fantastic, unprecedented, something that's never been done before by a president. So well, then another year goes by, Michael. And yeah. on February 13th of 2015, and I'm going to use the word unprecedented again, something big happens. Eight days after Steve Bassett was meeting members of the five key committees and or, or faxing meeting requests, John Podesta, on his leave from the White House under the Obama transition team, says, tweets out the biggest tweet anybody could ever of a man in his position and says, finally, my biggest failure of 2014, once again, not securing the hashtag disclosure. I just want to say that disclosure, that hashtag was in reference to the disclosure lobby movement. So we see, so he hashtags that word disclosure of the UFO files. Then he hashtags the truth is still out there. And he CCs Marine Dowd of the New York Times. And the reason he cc'd marine dowd was a she wrote an article in 97 called we're not alone that had to do with roswell and he also did it in a very subtle way to tell the media that some stuff is going to come and you should start asking questions my presidential candidate is, is is ready to do this whatever this is great stuff right two one month later president obama comes on to jimmy kimmel and yeah. Kimmel asks him scripted the exact same question. I mean, this is unbelievable. You don't make this stuff up. <laughs> and he asks him the same question. And Obama answers in a way where he injects some humor into that response, but still sort of hints at that there's something there, right? He says, you know, the aliens are in strict control of us. They won't allow us to talk. We're instructed to say these things if we come on TV. I mean, all these different things. I mean, funny, 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 but hey, by the way, there's some truth in that and the audience laughs, whatever, makes a joke about it. Then a couple months go by and on September 29th, John Podesta does yet another tweet. And this was directed right to the media. So Lena Dunham, who everyone may know of as, as the, the main um, protagonist, and, if you want to call and, it that, and, on and, the gir HBO and, Girls, right? And um, for, for the record, Obama did say, uh, he says, uh, laughingly, but he says, they won't let us tell you. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> exactly. Now, who those they are? Yeah. Well, we could, we could speculate on that, and we're going to get there. 
So so September so September 29th comes 2015 we're in. But and and Podesta tweets out because Lena Dunham interviews Hillary Clinton to a, to appeal to the millennial crowd to, to you know to get those votes and you know let's let, you know let's st- rock the vote for Hillary Clinton. And she doesn't ask her about aliens. So what Podesta does is he tweets out and he says, "Great interview Lena Dunham, but Lena ask her about aliens next time." Two exclamation points. Hashtag the truth is still out there and he CCs Hillary Clinton. Okay? So then October 6th comes, and exactly one week before Hillary's first critical Democratic debate, Clinton comes on to Stephen Colbert. And Colbert asks him about ETs, and Clinton goes through this whole spiel about how, you know, it, you know, it, if we could say something to ET, it's it's we want to cooperate, you know, we, you know, we want to be friends, we would expect to do something like that. And it kind of almost harks me back to the Reagan statement back, I think it was 87 to the United Nations, when even though what he said was, in, you know, uh, due in part to his you know, Star Wars defense initiative, he still says... I wonder what would happen if we were faced from an outside alien threat, if, if the world would you know, unite and just drop all of our differences. Th- there's key meaning behind all of this, right? Mm-hmm. December 30th comes of 2015, and Congress is out on holiday. So what John Podesta and Hillary Clinton decide to do is go to this small little town in New Hampshire called Conway, New Hampshire, and there was a reporter there, Damon Steer, who I've spoken to before, and he's, you know, for the Conway Daily Sun. And Hillary was there in 2008 when she was campaigning, and uh, she didn't really at- talk to him about a UFO question there. He asked it. But she approaches him, and this was no coincidence. She approaches him in 2015, and he asks her the almost, you know, identical questions. And she says something that blew my mind. It's never been said before by a presidential candidate. She says she's going to make a task force if she's president to look into this and, you know, know, send a task force to Area 51. But she says something else. She says, and by the way, I think we may have been visited before. We just don't know for sure. I mean, I Mm. could not even believe that. That is disclosure in my eyes. You know, what I worried about, though, and I always have, is uh, for me, I've never thought for a minute that you were ever going to get a president, no matter who it was, who's going to be able to come down that red carpet and tell us the truth, even if they know the truth. And sometimes these candidates will use that. I mean, and maybe they have good intentions, but I think once they get in there, uh, sometimes their their hands are tied behind their back. And so, I, I mean, it all sounds really good, but, you know, are they going to come out and admit that they've lied for all these years? So you make a good point here, mm-hmm. and this is something that will be part of this continuing story that I'm going to tell you. Okay. Um, I, Grant Cameron happens to believe that the presidents are definitely read in. Steve Bassett doesn't believe that. I kind of sim- sit somewhere in the middle of the two of them. I believe some presidents are told something, um, and some are not. And what that something is could simply just be, uh, yes, Mr. Presidential Candidate, or yes, Mr. President, uh, there, there is ETs, but that's all we can really tell you. Of course, it's speculation on my part. I don't really know. Um, but it's a good point you, re- you uh, make. And just hold on to that thought, though, because okay. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover that. Um, so December 15th happens, it's done. Now there's a new year. They, they, they wanted to see how much noise would be made, and there are some articles in mainstream media that come out about it, what, you know, what Clinton said, but not enough substance. February 11th, um, well, let me just back up. January comes, 2016, and the X-Files returns to television. And, and, and oh, to that point, the, the great show. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's Chris Carter who actually writes the script. I may have the name wrong. Yeah. But uh, the first episode comes and drops a truth bomb I mean, on everybody. But besides the point, something else has never been done before. Unprecedented, Michael. The mm-hmm. Central Intelligence Agency comes out for the first time in, I can't even remember how long, an agency that has always used disinformation tactics um, to to discredit uh, UFO believers. Um, and they come out on Twitter hyping the X-Files. And they put out and they hashtag out the word flying saucer, something that we haven't really heard in a while. We always hear the term UFO, which has now got a new nomenclature, as Hillary likes to call it, UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon. Um but they come out and they tweet 10 documents that would be appealing to Mulder and Scully if they were to investigate flying saucers. I mean, 
this is fascinating stuff. And the fact that they did a th almost a 360 turnaround on this, again, very unprecedented. So a month later in February, Obama comes back on TV. And this time he goes to the Ellen DeGeneres show. And there was a six-year-old girl by the name of Macy who a lot of people and your listeners might recall is a very intelligent little girl, very sweet. And she she remembers all of the presidents and can recite them back. I mean, it's pretty cool stuff. But she quizzes him on what's called, you know, the book of secrets and asks him whether aliens are real. Now, this is his response. And I'm quoting this. We haven't actually made direct contact with aliens yet. So two things here. One, that's the wrong answer. Right. We actually have made direct content. There's a plethora of evidence out there. And Lisa, you know, in, uh, at, at some point on this call, I would like her to talk about that scientific yeah. perspective. Um, but he says the word direct. What does that mean? He could have said we haven't made contacts at all. I mean, we don't even know if they're even real. He no, just says we right. haven't made direct contact, which to me means, did we make indirect contact with aliens? <laughs> that's so right. he was, yeah. so he was very careful. And when a president says something, he has to be careful with what he says. So the fact that he didn't even use the word contact at all was very appealing to me and caught my ears. So, uh, Many months pass, and, and, and Podesta comes on different platforms and stages. He goes to Vegas. He's interviewed by Steve Celibus, uh, you know, and reaffirming Clinton's thing about going into Area 51 and, and, and you know, looking into the ET issue. Then Clinton goes on to Kimmel and, and finally gets asked the same thing, and she's going to look into it and was very serious about it. So there's a couple things that happen, right? Now, something else happens after all of this stuff. Clinton loses, right? She's got a disgraced president of a husband right and she's also got a disgraced presidential election that she just lost two days after clinton loses the election and steve might have alluded to this on your show at some point but steve being in the business for 20 years and, and vetting a lot of people and forming a lot of relationships gets an encrypted text message on what's called the signal app I actually have it on my phone as well. It's a text end-to-end uh, -end encryption when you're texting somebody. And this person, who's known to Steve Bassett, works directly at the Pentagon uh, in the USAP programs, unacknowledged special access programs where the ET issue sits. And it just so happens that this person is within this group let's just use the word majestic 12 for just to kind of give context they sit in this group at military intelligence the pentagon that is specifically responsible for managing the et issue and i don't have the text message in front of me so again i have to paraphrase but from what i recall this person texted steve in a one directional text that said we're ready for this if you can create a situation where the SecDef, i.e. the Secretary of Defense, is approached, he didn't refer to who should be approaching him, then once the Secretary of Defense is approached, a situation can be created where the Secretary of Defense doesn't know anything about the ET issue. They're not read in. So that's when the Secretary of Defense will get asked by the ET issue. He'll turn back around to the people that work under him in the Pentagon and say, well, can someone tell me what the hell is these people talking about with the ET issues, there's something going on. That's when this person said to Steve, we are ready to support the Secretary of Defense with the resources that he needs to cut a deal with the White House and make the disclosure announcement. We want it done under Obama. Now, he didn't say that they did not want it under Trump. They were just hoping Obama would do it. And that's why a lot of the disclosure lobby movement was focused on trying to get Obama to do it. But he did it. That's fine. But the fact that this Pentagon person said that is not only bizarre, but it's extremely telling about the hearts that are changing within the military. Now, here's something else okay. your listeners may know. So your listeners may have heard some of these things I'm saying in bits and pieces. I'm going to tie this all together to cohesively. Uh, as you know, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, Michael, as the okay, same. Well, I'm Aristotle not, said that. I'm not rushing you, so go ahead. I want details. Sure. <laughs> yeah. No, and, 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 and detail is good. Yes. Um, so the guy says this to Steve. That's fantastic. Now, we have an organization that Lisa referred to earlier, about 20 minutes ago, WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks happened to break in 
or get John Podesta's emails. Now, I happen to be, I am convinced it wasn't the Russians at all. That was just smoke and mirrors. I happen to believe that there is a group inside the Pentagon. Let's call them the Alliance, if you will. I'm just trying to come up with easy terms here. These are men and women. I know a lot of people have uh, uh, disregard and disrespect for our government because they think that they're extremely corrupt and there are elements that are. But people need to understand that there are good people in military and, and the Pentagon. And so I believe that there's a group of people in the Pentagon that manage all this that wanted to not see Clinton get into office. They didn't want any kind of dynasty running the country. And so they are the ones, the Americans, that gave WikiLeaks Podesta's emails. Now, the interesting thing about Podesta's emails is this. What we learned is that a guy by the name of Tom DeLong, who is a rocker from Blink-182. He was the lead singer. Most of your listeners should be aware of, of who Blink-182 is. I grew up listening to them. They're a punk rock band, or let's say alternative rock. Yeah. Um, they weren't my first choice of music, but they were talented. And so Tom <laughs> DeLong leaves Blink-182 to pursue the UFO issue because he's got a lot of passion, kind of like myself. And being that he is a celebrity, okay, quote-unquote, he pitched a story to the Pentagon on how disclosure should happen in his own eyes, right? Through documentaries and books. And we learn all this in WikiLeaks. But there's some interesting emails I picked out tonight that I want to read to you. They're not that long. Okay. So just bear with me. Tom DeLong emails John Podesta on January 25th, 2016 at 16.04, which is 4.04 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the subject is General McCasland. Now, this is what it says, and I'm quoting this. He mentioned he's a skeptic, and skeptic is in quotes. He's not. I've been working with him for four months. I just got done giving him a four-hour presentation on the entire project a few weeks ago. Trust me, the advice has already been happening on how to do all of this. He just has to say that out loud, meaning that he's a skeptic. But he is very, very aware. And I want you to listen to this, Michael. As he was in charge of all of the stuff, when Roswell crashed, they shipped it to the laboratory at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. General McCasland was in charge of that exact laboratory up to a couple years ago. He not only knows what I'm trying to achieve, he helped assemble my advisory team. He's a very important man, best Tom DeLong. What this, we know now, that the Pentagon has given Tom DeLong an advisory team of 10 people. Three of the names of those 10 people leaked out in this WikiLeaks. One of those people is General Neil McCasland, who now works for Applied Research Associates, I believe, ARA. I believe that's the name. Correct me if I'm wrong. But he was the former commander of the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory at Wright-Patterson, where allegedly those Roswell bodies went post-crash. That's one email. I want wow. you to keep that in the back of your mind. Okay. The next email, and this one's a little longer, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. Again, from Tom DeLong to John Podesta. This was a year earlier, on September 24th, at 2015, at 1629, so 429. This is what he says. I received your email address from your assistant. As far, I, I'm sorry, as from time to time, I would like to get you information that is not appropriate for others to see. And here is one of those items. The ranking general, i.e. General McCasland, on my committee has some ideas for a memo that would help provide context for his and the other officers work on this project here are the general's thoughts this is phenomenal stuff i was thinking of, and this is i'm reading what the general said in his memo here okay. i was thinking a bit more about what a white house memo should say something like these points to all federal agencies in light of the president's policy on stem citing official policy encouraging the study of science, technology, engineering, and math, some background on your project, the administration encourages a favorable public affairs position by all agencies, appoints NASA to lead this, and then in, in parentheses, this kind of public outreach is in NASA's job jar, and if no agency is appointed, all will simply note and follow the memo and likely do nothing, in parentheses. Finally, and to coordinate with the Department of Defense, the Department of National Intelligence, DNI, and the NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Association, and I put in parentheses, or he does, the other major space actors putting a bit of light on them. So that's the second email. This is a general 
that is writing to Tom DeLonge exactly how disclosure should go and exactly how this project should go. I mean, this is, again, you, you, this is not even a Hollywood movie. You don't yeah. make this stuff up. <laughs> and then finally, this is the third name that's the uh, the other two names I'm about to leak out here. Well, I didn't leak them, WikiLeaks did, but I'm going right. to tell your listeners. Is we have a meeting invite on January 25th of 2016 from John Podesta to ne General Neil McCasland, Tom DeLong, Melia Fisher, who works for Hillary Clinton, and then two other guys. One of the guys' name is Michael Carey. And Michael Carey is former special assistant to the commanding general of the U.S. Space Command in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I believe that's where they're housed, or that's one of their facilities. The second guy, and this is the most interesting, talk about military industrial complex, Rob F. Weiss. Currently today, if you go on LinkedIn and look him up, he is the executive vice president and general manager of advanced development programs at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. Not only is Lockheed Martin the number one military defense contractor in the world, but Skunk Works is the secret research R&D development arm that is known to have reverse engineered alien crafts. So here you have the guy that pretty much runs Area 51 saying that he's in this meeting, a Google Hangout meeting, and they go back and forth in the email on what times you know need to be set. Unprecedented stuff, Michael. And there's an actually an email that I'm not going to read, but Rob Weiss of Lockheed Skunk Works actually emails DeLong asking him for an update on this project. And Michael Carey wrote the forward to Tom DeLong's book, Secret Machines. So something is going on at the Pentagon where they're trying to get this information out. The Pentagon doesn't want their fingerprints all over this. They need to figure out a way to do it. And Tom DeLong is the only way. Or I'm sorry, Tom DeLong is one of the only ways. Now, the last thing that the last two things that happened, I promise this is all coming full circle. Oh, that's cool. That's fine. The last two things are two days before Trump takes office, and I'm not even mentioning the pardon of Chelsea Manning, which was I didn't even I couldn't believe they did that, and I'm I'm happy they did because that is sort of a nod to whistleblowers because Manning could have been you know indicted on 120 counts of espionage. Um, they 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 let him go in May or let her go in May, um, but the CIA for the second time in their tenure tweets out and spills 13 million documents of previously classified information on the web for everybody to look at. Some of those documents talk about uh, psychic powers with Yuri Geller and how yeah. they were convinced, but we're not talking about Yuri. Um, and there was about 2,500 different documents on unidentified aerial phenomenon. But here's the interesting thing. Some people will argue, well, well, you know, Russ, but yeah, the CIA had already declassified them years ago and they were at the National Archives. And that's true, Michael. That's true. They were at the National Archives and they were on one of four computer terminals. But you had to physically go to the National Archives to look them up and nobody was really doing that. Well, yeah, and they know that people, you know, people, unless you make it real easy for people, most people don't bother. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's a good, good point you make. And I'm going to get into that. So, so, right, people don't want to get off and bother with it because, you know, it's time out of their day. Right. Yeah. But it's the most important issue of our lifetime that we're dealing with here. So in any case, uh, they, they, they dump those documents out for the public to see and scour through. Here it is, everybody. We're giving you Christmas. Here is the Christmas gift. OK, and it's done. And then finally, and I don't want to talk about politics here because I think there's a lot of crap that goes on in politics. I, I'm not I into politics and there's a lot of theater. But I won. The one thing I will say is I did not vote for Trump. However, however. Trump comes out during the inauguration speech, just before Disclosure Activists was formed. And he says something that is direct relation to the, what we call the truth embargo, right? So the truth embargo, by the way, means that the government never really covered these things up, right? They just discredited them and they embargoed them, similar to like Bassett likes to make the analogy to Cuba. There was an embargo up until recently on Cuba. We know it's there. We're not going to talk about it. We're not going to go there. It's similar to the UAP phenomenon. You know, yes, there's things there, but we're just, we're not going there. We're not touching that. So they use discredit to do it. But he comes out, Trump, and he says this, we're standing at the birth of a new millennium 
ready to unlock the mysteries of space, to cure the earth of its diseases, and to invest in technologies, industries, and um, there was another word he used, of the future. That is directly what the truth embargo is about. Now, Trump and Bannon and all of them, as crappy as politicians as they may be, at least half the Americans think so, uh, they're not stupid people. And they certainly know that there was a big disclosure movement. And there's certainly, at least I could allude to this a little later, but there's a lot of money to be made in space. So there is a very distinct possibility that if the public, we the public, can get up off of our asses and be activists for the greatest story of humankind, which is what we're trying to do here, that will give us a way to push the media and get unleashed because those editors at these big institutions are holding these journalists tight. That'll give them enough, for lack of better terms, ammunition to get up and go talk to the Pentagon and dig into this issue. And once the media does that, it's all over. So the Russell, two key I would like to make one, one other point about Trump that I think is, is relevant. You know, part of the problem with disclosure is that once the government goes on the record about a lot of things that have happened over a number of decades, some of which involve collusion with whom we might call negative ETs, um, you know, allowing, for instance, the abduction phenomenon to continue um, while certain powers that be were receiving technological advances, you know, that were well before their time. Um, you know, if you've worked in government for any length of time and have become president of the United States, you, to some degree, are complicit. The thing that's different in this particular case is that Trump has never worked in government before. That's correct. So, so Trump could be in a position, and I didn't vote for Trump either, but he could be in a position where he will say, look, none of this is my fault, and I'm going to be the hero, right? Because he likes to be the hero. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be the hero, and I'm going to be the one who is finally going to tell our citizens what's been going on. Because if you think about part of Trump's platform and you know, a lot of these recent actions against immigrants and these sorts of things are related to the safety of the American people. And I can definitely see a scenario in which Trump will be the hero, right? If he digs into these narratives, you know, which I think he will, and that's part of our effort, of course, with our petition and you know, there have been other petitions and other sorts of public pressure put on Trump and his administration to start asking those questions. And I think, like you said before, there is a lot of money to be made in space. I just read an article today about one mission to, you know, check out one asteroid that could result in quadrillions was the number that was used of dollars in revenues from mineral mining and these sorts of things, not to mention space tourism and then, you know, the possible militarization of space. You know, Trump wants to build a wall with Mexico. I can imagine, you know, he may go back to the Reagan era and say, you know, we we need to go full bore with, with you know, the Star Wars yeah. missile systems and all of these kinds of things. So that's kind of the narrative that I can see potentially happening and how he would explain it to the public I, I, it, uh, guys hold them thoughts right there i want to pick right back up on this but we do have to take a break so uh not cut the conversation off i want to pick back up on it uh i think it's very interesting and you know i agree you know if why not and i try if, if anybody uh presidential that is uh was going to come out and spill the beans why not use a guy who's not been uh, in politics and you know yeah i could see that so let's take a break here folks Let's get back to it. My guest, Russ uh, Kelka, and uh, we've got Dr. Lisa 
Gullinier, I, 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 I know I'm chopping that all up again. See, I took too much time in between saying it now, so I, I apologize, Doctor. That's that's. Uh, say it one more time for me. It's Galarno. Galarno. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna write this down my way. You can call me Doctor. Dr. G. A lot of people do. That works fine for me. All right. Thank you. Now, we had left off uh, uh, discussing, I guess, uh, Trump, maybe his possible role in all this. So I would like you to get go right back to uh, where we left off and, uh, and, and we can go from there. Well, I, I would just say I think that there are multiple scenarios for disclosure happening potentially this year, perhaps, you know, the first half of this year. And I think that's something, you know, that we contemplate. Um, one thing, you know, could be, as we said, that the Trump administration will become very interested. I mean, they're doing a lot of budget cutting and, you know, really looking at various agencies and their budgets. And I'm sure the black budget will come to their attention. Um, I hope and, so. <laughs> you know, presidents also have the ability to reclassify any documents that they choose to reclassify. So even if President Trump hasn't achieved, you know, what they might call cosmic top secret clearance, um, he still has the executive authority to reclassify pretty much whatever he wants, um, you know, unless they can figure out a way to keep it hidden. I think he's tenacious enough to do so. So that's one potential scenario. Um, there are other world governments that have already disclosed to some degree or another um, or at the very least have, you know, been in a process of soft disclosure. So governments like the UK and Mexico, um, South American governments, all sorts of governments, even the Vatican and the Dalai Lama have talked about ETs and, you know, all of these kinds of things. Um, yeah, I think the Pope said that they'd be willing to baptize them. I'm sure they would. Yeah, yeah I'm sure they would. <laughs> I did say that. Yeah. I don't see so, E.T. going to the Vatican to get baptized should they arrive, but anyways. <laughs> well, you know, as far as I can tell, E.T., for the most part, benevolent E.T.s are advanced spiritual beings, you know, so they've got their own sort of thing going with that. Um, but I also think the whistleblowers and the leaks are definitely another possibility. Um, it's been speculated widely in disclosure circles for quite some time that both Edward Snowden and Julian Assange have what you might call uh, the ET files. Um, and some of that stuff, yes, came out in the Podesta email dumps, um, but it, there's reason to believe there's a lot more, you know, so what could motivate WikiLeaks to finally come out with this. Well, you know, as Russell was saying earlier, um, Assange is about to get kicked out of the Ecuadorian embassy, you know, so there he, he could make some decisions that he might not otherwise make. The other possibility, um, which I find to be fairly likely, is that the incidence of mass UFO slash UAP sightings will increase. Um, they already are increasing, you know, um, there's been, you know, several percentage point increases over the last couple of years in sightings documented by organizations like MUFON. Um, the crop formations, you know, there are several hundred of those every year. Uh, and they tend to be ignored, which is interesting because at one point there was some debunking done and a couple of guys went out in a crop field with boards and rope and managed to make some, frankly, pretty ugly crop circles, but they managed to do it. Um, and, you know, so a lot of, you know, scientifically minded, technically minded, engineering focused people who, you know, are very intelligent.